from the world's leading center for finance, the arts, publishing, science, research, media, innovation, and much more. This is Metro Focus with Raphael P. Roman, and tonight with Mike Schneider. The crisis isn't over. It can't be the new normal to have senior citizens trapped in their homes for two weeks with no water and electricity. That's unacceptable. What happened to the grid? We have still this failure to imagine how bad it can be. We better learn from this one. Where are we going next for regional transit? The system, this complex public transportation system, was much more vulnerable than anyone could have ever imagined. And what to say to children about catastrophes? I think the important part is parents have to remember to be calm. They are the model. Funding for this program is made possible by James and Merrill Tisch, Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Jody and John Arnhold, and the Nissan Foundation. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company. Hello, I'm Rafael P. Roman. Welcome to Metro Focus. Well, the sun came out, and in many places, the power is back on. But for the millions caught in Sandy's path, the last few weeks have been cold and dark, and the crisis is far from over. As Metro Focus reporter Rick Carr found on Manhattan's Lower East Side, on the hard-hit New York waterfront, there is frustration and a long road to recovery. The bad news two weeks after the storm was that pumps were still sucking water from the basement of the Knickerbocker Village apartment complex just two blocks from the East River. The good news was that generators had arrived on the scene, and so some residents finally had power. Federal Emergency Management Agency officials were out in force. So were representatives of the Red Cross, carting boxes of supplies to a tent in a nearby park. Residents of the complex, who still lacked running water, lined up for bags of personal hygiene supplies. Razor, shampoo, conditioners, face cloth, facial wash, everything you could possibly need for your toiletries. Basic survival uh, stuff. Emilio Velazquez had picked up one of the bags, along with an extra blanket and some drinking water. He lives in one of the more than 1,600 units in the low and middle income complex. He and his 12-year-old son lived without lights, heat, running water, or a working kitchen for days after the storm. And then? Three trucks from the Red Cross came, and that was the first time I had a hot meal in five days. They gave me a bowl of uh, mon mushroom soup. I still could taste it. <laughs> New York State Senator Daniel Squadron was making the rounds in the neighborhood to check up on the situation at Knickerbocker Village. We're still two weeks out. Uh, somewhere that I wish we weren't, which is in that life-sustaining phase. It would be great if we had kind of stabilized everyone and we could start thinking about what are the consequences, what are we doing for businesses and communities. We're not quite there fully, unfortunately, and that's, that's really a problem. Squadron's district includes a lot of the waterfront in Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn. He says a lot of businesses there are in the same boat as residents of Knickerbocker Village. Squadron worries that big storms like Hurricane Sandy and the floods that come with them may be the new normal in the metro area. In this building alone, we've had an evacuation twice in 14 months. It can't be the new normal to sustain this kind of damage. It can't be the new normal to have senior citizens trapped in their homes for two weeks with no water and electricity. That's unacceptable. Knickerbocker Village resident Emilio Velazquez says Sandy has done one good thing for his community. That's one of the things about this disasters. The community get together. And we realize that the basic thing in life is we as a family, the human family. Velazquez says he's lucky. His apartment has power. His neighbors who don't may have to wait until the end of the week. On Manhattan's Lower East Side, I'm Rick Carr for Metro Focus. The crisis as winter approaches is widespread. In the western section of Coney Island, residents are still struggling in buildings without power, heat, or running water, and there are long lines for food and supplies. But Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism students John Gerberg and Kristen Reed found a beacon of hope and help at the Coney Island Gospel Assembly Church, where community members, volunteers, and church staff are solving problems around the clock. We are the solution center, so to speak. Yeah, we feed people, clothe people, sit with people, cry with people, love people, um, want to see people through and back on their feet. And this is what Christ did. 
and this is what we are about. The Gospel Assembly has partnered with everyone from the mayor's office and the Red Cross to occupy Sandy to distribute aid. The, the women who run this church um, and the men who run this church um, are in this community and they're directly affected and they're exhausted and tired and overworked. So we went to her and said, just how, how can we help support you do what you need to do? And that's how the relationship began at the end of last week. Occupy groups are working throughout Coney Island, Staten Island, the Rockaways, and New Jersey. Around Coney Island, volunteers delivered water, medicine, and food to elderly residents who remain stuck in powerless high-rises in upper floor apartments. I have water for you. Okay. Do you need anything else? No, thank you. We have food and everything. Okay. No, You're welcome. At the Gospel Assembly, trucks arrived from as far away as Texas with food and supplies. The church is both a direct distribution center and a redistribution hub for about a half dozen other smaller centers on the west end of Coney Island. And in the midst of helping others, volunteers also help the church clean up its own flooded basement. The general feeling I think is kind of two part. The first part is that this is post-disaster and people are under stress and there is tension and there is exhaustion and there's worry um, and that's very real however at the same time there is so much beauty and people helping people and it's wonderful everybody's rallying together we will make it we're gonna make it the power outages that plagued Long Island New Jersey and New York weeks after the hurricane passed through are a puzzle to many how can millions of homes and businesses be cut off for so long? And why did the electricity grid fail in such a huge way? Joining me now is Peter Kelly Detweiler, a contributor to Forbes magazine and a former executive at one of the Northeast's biggest power companies, Constellation Energy. Peter, welcome. It's a pleasure Thank to have you here with us. Now, Peter, we hear a lot about the grid. What went wrong with the grid? Well, first of all, the grid is massive. It's 200,000 miles of transmission lines probably worth about a trillion dollars. And uh, it reaches you know, from power plants to transmission lines to transformers down to distribution lines that affect people's or reach people's homes. We had a storm that was unprecedented, lowest barometric pressure recorded in the Atlantic area and 1,100 miles in reach. So essentially we had this massive wind and water event that hit an infrastructure that's been around in some cases over 50 years. There was inevitable failure. Is our grid up here in the Northeast older, more vulnerable than other grids? Well, it's, um, it's a little bit older, um, but I would say that the history of power grid failure, we saw a big failure in Texas in 2011. We saw the blackout in uh, the whole Northeast in 2003. There's nothing particularly different about this grid from others in terms of vulnerability. And why can't the power companies get the power back, or why didn't they get the power back more quickly than they did? Well. In smaller events, when, when a utility sees a storm coming, there's a, mil, a mutual assistance group, and utilities call other groups from outside the region for assistance. In this case, the groups that would have called the other groups were themselves affected. So they had to reach out and talk to utilities as far away as California. In fact, mili military airlifts brought in bucket trucks and crews from California. So the scale of the thing was unprecedented. I think we also underestimated how bad it was going to be. But even if we had known, we pretty much put the full court press on in terms of getting things back in shape. But it's a complicated system and a lot of things broke at the same time. So what can we do to avoid those problems? First of all, we haven't planned for the severe events we likely to see. So for example, two years ago, in, or last year in Connecticut, their worst case scenario in Connecticut was for loss of power to 100,000 customers. And they saw 8, 800,000 with Irene, 500,000 with the snowstorm. So, we have still this failure to imagine how bad it can be. We better learn from this one. But then tree trimming, more maintenance, probably more redundancy in the system, more crews, things we're going to have to pay for. And what about things like, uh, I, I've, I've seen in your writings, the uh, microgrid, a smart grid, those things can be done? They can. Um, there's this whole discussion around hardening of assets, if you will. Um, there's going to be inevitable outages. There always will be. And in fact, on average, um, every day, half a million people are without power for at least two hours, someplace in the United States. Some of that's inevitable. But microgrids and other ways of coping, a microgrid is essentially a generator and a hardened distribution system to emergency services, police, fire, maybe a gas station, maybe a shelter, uh, perhaps a grocery store, something that helps cope. 
with those inevitable disasters. And they can happen. In Connecticut, for example, they estimated that if they had a Cat 3 hurricane hit Connecticut right on, they would lose 70 to 80 percent of their trees and be out for over a month. Okay. Well, Peter, thank you so much. It's been very helpful. My pleasure. In New Jersey, the shore communities got the worst of Hurricane Sandy, but even in cities farther north, damage is severe. NJ Today's David Cruz reports now from Jersey City, where federal aid in the millions of dollars is flowing in. Hurricane Sandy swept into Jersey City, pounding its shoreline with heavy rain and high winds, pushing the Hudson River into neighborhoods that rarely flood. By the time it was over, Joseph Gianni's home was destroyed. We had approximately five feet of water uh, in our home, in our living space, and uh, neighbors had anywhere from five to eight feet of water. Gianni was just one of several hundred city residents who've come through the FEMA Registration Center since it opened. FEMA spokesperson Maria Padron says the most common need is housing. We have a lot of people in different shelters. And we have a program that is uh, the transitional shelter uh, program that uh, different hotels have been partnering with us. Padron estimated that close to 60,000 people across the state are facing serious housing issues. All told, close to 200,000 have applied for FEMA assistance. The agency says that it has distributed close to $9 million in aid. I could tell you would go over with you, but the storm, it hit, it hit so fast. You, you had no time to react. I lost everything I owned, personal possessions, and you know, but one good thing came out of it, I made it out alive. Mayor Jeremiah Healy stopped by the Senate to meet with residents and thank FEMA staff. He says he's been going nonstop since the storm hit, assessing damage and trying to direct his residents to sources of help. Right across from us here was these, these folks were wiped out. There's a whole bunch of apartment units over there. Uh, it's actually JC Housing Authority, the, the residents told me. And I toured a couple of the apartments. They're just gone, basement, first floor. FEMA says this center will stay open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week for as long as the need exists. Despite their genuine hardships, most of the residents here will have a home to return to. And in that regard, they are the lucky ones. In Jersey City, I'm David Cruz for Metro Focus. Like the electric grid and so much of the region's infrastructure, transit systems also collapsed in the storm. Tunnels closed, train lines were crushed by falling trees, the storm surge even pushed boats onto train tracks. NJ Today's managing editor, Mike Schneider, asked Martin Robbins, founding director of the Alan Voorhees Transportation Center at Rutgers University and former executive director of NJ Transit, for an overview and an update. The system, this complex public transportation system, was much more vulnerable than anyone could have ever imagined. We, there were always points of vulnerability. I can remember path flooding back in the early 90s at Hoboken. I always was worried about Hoboken Terminal and the, and the yard because it's right next to the river. But to see so many parts of the system fall victim in so many different ways to Mother Nature, uh, it was incomprehensible. And the recovery is going to be very, very long and hard. That's what I was going to ask you. You, you were there to build this system. Yeah. It, a lot of this is your handiwork. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> so, so how do you rebuild it? Do, uh, and in fact, do you rebuild it the same way or do you have to do some things differently? Well, obviously, I think it needs to be rebuilt. Um, you need to think about uh, vulnerability and, uh, and uh, redundancy as much as possible because uh, the system right now is very, very subject to uh, the ravages of, uh, of a storm like the one that we saw. And so it, vulnerability means move, move things out of harm's way. That well, makes sense, but right. what, what about redundancy? I mean, have parallel ways of getting around? Well, for instance, uh, one of the things that I've heard, is, understand, is that there's a, an electric substation in the Meadowlands in Kearney that feeds the most, uh, in, crucial part of the rail system between Newark Penn Station and New York Penn Station. And that 
uh, substation was, uh, was badly damaged and is out of service right now. That is probably going to hold back New Jersey Transit's recovery. That, that absence of electric power that, to that particular location, it's probably going to hold back New Jersey Transit's recovery more than any single thing. How many people do you think right now are being inconvenienced because of the rail service disruptions? I would say uh, the rail service describes, well, I mean, 80,000 plus people ride the, the rails every day on New Jersey Transit. And I think that uh, probably uh, at least 50% uh, of the people are seriously inconvenienced. There are no quick fixes here. Well, there are fixes. Uh, I think that it's not going to be uh, indefinite. I, I just, I don't have an answer as to when that substation is going to be on. But as you can see, with each passing day, uh, lines are being restored. Uh, there is a recovery going on. Some of the things that happened, like the loss of electric power to the system in the outlying areas, trees falling on tracks, flooding in stations, things like that, those things are, are, are now uh, healing themselves and are being repaired. But there are some critical things, like a path is still not uh, back in service between um, uh, Jur Journal Square and the World Trade Center, uh, and Hoboken and the World Trade Center. Those are critical, critical links. And then that substation that I've been referring to a couple of times, which controls the Northeast Corridor, which New Jersey Transit, over the time in which I was uh, uh, at, at New Jersey Transit, became more and more uh, reliant upon from Newark Penn Station to New York Penn Station, that several mile stretch uh, called the High Line before you go into the tunnel, that is, it, without the, uh, the requisite amount of electric power, that is really a problem. Martin Robbins, there's so much more to address. <laughs> and apparently we're going to have the time and the need to address it <laughs> well, again. Well, I'll be glad to come back. <laughs> thank you, my friend. Okay, thank you. Help for individuals and homeowners is front and center in this crisis. But there are other victims of Sandy. Thousands of small businesses are suffering huge losses. So far, the Federal Small Business Administration says it has received 26,000 applications for loans in the tri-state area. In New York City, the Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services, Robert Walsh, told me that for this disaster, his agency is trying to come up with some innovative solutions. Commissioner, what has been the effect on small businesses by Sandy overall in the city? Well, uh, obviously a lot of um, small businesses have been devastated, impacted, some obliterated. I was out in Red Hook um, you know, a day, day ago with the SBA administrator, a labor secretary, going around door-to-door, -door, um, Fairway, a big grocery store, 300 employees, totally wiped out. Uh, others along the pier, whether they were craftsmen, um, a, a glass maker, a pie maker, all, all sorts of different businesses along that were just destroyed completely. Mm. Uh, others had a lot of water in their basement and they're you know, picking up the pieces now. I just left uh, Dumbo in Brooklyn mm -hmm. where a um, woman who has a cookie place of all places uh, and desserts, uh, she kept her staff on they're repainting, they're scraping, they've gotten the water out of their basement, and they're going to open up uh, tomorrow. So it's, it's in different stages, but obviously along the water, Rockaway, South Shore, Coney Island, Red Hook, Dumbo, Lower Manhattan, all, all impacted pretty badly. And, and how can you help businesses who literally have no location out of which to conduct their businesses? Well, there's a couple of ways we can. One is we set up an emergency loan program, and we got uh, generous support from Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. and the New York City Economic Development Corporation, where we have loans, emergency loans, up to $25,000 mm -hmm. at a no interest for the first six months, 1% going for the next 24 months. And that will be a big lift. Mm -hmm. In fact, thousands of people have asked about it, and we have a number of businesses already in the pipeline looking to get that money out and getting that money out quickly. Mm -hmm. We could also hook them up with the SBA disaster loan. Mm -hmm. Karen Mills, the SBA administrator, was, was with me yesterday. We went you know, door to door through the Brooklyn Navy Yard. 
where a lot of businesses got you know hit and hit hard. Uh, you're setting up temporary locations for some of these businesses? We, we do have temporary loco locations uh, called business solution centers. People could call 311 to find out where the nearest business solution center is. Uh, it's a one-stop where we will be there, the state will be there, the fed, federal government will be there to help uh, small businesses, whether it's with their insurance, mm -hmm with their, um, uh, you know, getting back open and making sure all the permits are in place, or the, or the big, bigger issues of, of grants or loans. Do you have an estimate uh, as of yet of how much money will have been lost by small businesses as a result of this? No, it's a, it's a good question, but, you know, we're still collecting uh, information. I, you know, it's hundreds and hundreds of businesses. And you got to remember, it's not just those businesses, but the people, right. the, the people that lost their jobs. Right. And we just got $7.5 million secured so we could get some of those dislocated workers back into jobs at right. the Parks Department. All right, Commissioner, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. Catastrophic loss from Superstorm Sandy is not all physical damage. Children, as we saw after 9-11, are often traumatized by disasters just because they have no way to put the events in perspective. Dr. Harold Kopowitz, a leading expert on child psychology and trauma, told me that there are ways to help minimize the dangers to children's mental health and reasons to be hopeful for their recovery. The overwhelming majority of kids are remarkably resilient. In fact, it is remarkable because they go through terribly stressful times and they still manage to continue to function well, they continue to do well at school, and they actually look and are well. Oh. There's a smaller percentage of kids who will have one of two reactions. One, they'll have an acute stress reaction. Much more than just worry, they will be overwhelmed with concerns about the storm, about the potential of another storm, about bad things happening to them mm -hmm. that are so worrisome that they do stop functioning. They can't concentrate. They can't sleep. They lose their appetite. They're not able to have fun. And then for those kids, some of them, this will persist for weeks and sometimes for more than a month, and then it's actually post-traumatic uh, post stress disorder. And is it obvious when a child is experiencing these things, or are there warning signs that parents and other adults should be looking out for? Oh, I think it's very important, in fact, for all parents now to keep an eye on their kids, even if they were fortunate and didn't happen to be directly in the eye of the storm, or they didn't lose power, or they didn't lose their home, or God forbid, one of their family members, but they watched TV, they heard about it, people talked about it, and now they worry about the next storm. What you watch for is simple things. Number one, what's the baseline of your children? Are they talkative by nature or are they quiet? Mm -hmm. Are they easygoing or are they naturally very sensitive? Do they eat normally? Do they go to sleep without trouble? What gives them pleasure? Do they watch baseball and really enjoy it or basketball? Mm -hmm. If there's a change in any of those behaviors, where all of a sudden there's more worry and concern, where things that they enjoyed, like a certain board game, or uh, for older kids, a certain activity, and they don't want to do it, and they're starting to withdraw, and you start to see that they're avoiding life in any way, that's a red flag that parents should really pay attention to. And, and what should parents and other adults be saying to kids who experienced the, uh, the storm, or like you said, who just watch it on TV and, and, and have been hearing about it? Well, I think parents should do a lot of things, and I think this is a great learning moment because there will be other storms, there will be other man-made disasters mm -hmm. and natural disasters. I think the important part is parents have to remember to be calm. They are the model. There's a great uh, statement that they always make when you get on an airplane. If there's turbulence and the mask comes down, please put it on yourself first before you put it on your child. Mm -hmm. And that means that you have to take care of yourself. You have to be realistic and calm about this. You have to stick to routines. You have to go to sleep on time. If you go to church on Sunday, you should go to church. And you should be a model mm -hmm. of routine. The second thing you have to do is you have to turn off the TV. It's kind of amusing <laughs> since we're on television. Sure. but. The, re, the, the trouble with 24-7 television is that we fill up the air with lots of images. And we, unfortunately, have to see the image of houses being destroyed or people being terribly upset. 
And the reoccurrence of rewatching that is very, very difficult for little kids because they don't realize it's a past event. For them, it's all over a new event. So being calm and turning off the TV are the two most important things. I think the third thing is to explore with your child what they are afraid of and what their fantasies are, usually much worse than what, they, what the reality is. And finally, Doctor, where, where should parents go to get more information about all this? Well, I think there's lots of good sources. One of them, by the way, which I really like, is Sesame Street. Wonderful, wonderful video after uh, Katrina. And what it talks about is the narrative, giving a story for kids to make sense of something traumatic, because otherwise they feel disorganized and overwhelmed. And Big Bird's the main character who <laughs> worries before the storm, is very upset during the storm, the aftermath where they've lost things, but still the resilience. And I have to tell you that the childmind.org, uh, a free website that's scientifically sound, doesn't take money from pharmaceutical companies, is a tr terrific place where we're constantly updating information and using experts from around the world who can talk to parents and give them the information that makes them feel better and wiser as parents. Well, doctor, thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Anytime. You can find a complete list of where to get help and where to volunteer to help on our website, metrofocus.org. And of course, all our segments and programs are always online. Well, that's it for this edition of Metro Focus. For all of us at Metro Focus and at WLIW and JTVN 13, I'm Rafael Piroman. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Funding for this program was made possible by James and Merrill Tisch, Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Jody and John Arnhold, and the Nissan Foundation. Corporate funding for Metro Focus was provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company.